Perfect time management, it's half past one, and I have the honor now to open the first section, dissecting critical theory, and at the same time to introduce our first keynote speaker. The first section, as Stefan has already outlined, is about the question of preserving concepts and perspectives from the body of critical theory. What could be critical continuations of the classical canon of the so-called Frankfurt School, and which concepts may have lost their analytical capacity. We are very grateful that Estelle Ferrarese, who has worked intensively on aspects of these questions, has accepted our invitation to give the first keynote, and I am happy to welcome you here. Estelle Ferrarese, Ferrarese is Professor of Ethics and Political Philosophy at the Picardie Jules Verne University in Amiens. She is also a senior member at the university at the Institut Universitaire de France in Paris. Her research focuses on social and political philosophy, critical theory, feminist philosophy, politics of forms of life, vulnerability, and theories of democracy. From 2012 to 2016, she was professor for social and political theory at the University de Strasbourg. Um, she has also been a researcher at the Centre Marc Bloch in Berlin a visiting professor at the New School for Social Research in New, in New York and an Alexander von Humboldt Foundation Fellow at the Humboldt University in Berlin and the University of Potsdam. Her published books include Vulnerability and Critical Theory, theory published in 2018, and La Fragilité du Souci des Autres, Adorno et Le Caire, also published in 2018, which was translated to English in 2020 by Edinburgh University Press. Furthermore, she is the author of numeral, numerous articles on critical and feminist theory. We will then have a comment by Rainer Forst, who, um, whom I would also like, like to warmly welcome and briefly introduce. Rainer Forst is Professor of Political Theory and Philosophy at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. He is the Director of the Research Center Normative Orders. In 2012, the German Research Association DFG awarded Rainer Forst with the Leibniz Prize for his academic work, which is the most prestigious award, research award in Germany. Since 2017, Forst is a research professor for political theory at the Wissenschaftszentrum für Sozialforschung WZB in Berlin. And we are, also, we are also very much looking forward to your comment, Rainer. But now the floor is open to you, Estelle, and your talk, the title, we can read there. So um, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very honored to uh, open this very important conference. Um, so I am uh, I'm going to, to do my best to meet the expectation that the title have raised, because basically this is Professor Lessonish title, so it sounds very catchy and very sexy. I'm not sure I will do what you expect, but still, let's try. Um, so, dissecting, since we are in, in the um, uh, dissecting se section here, implies the methodological removal and dissociation of anatomical elements. This is the definition. And this is what I propose to do in order to think about vulnerability using critical theory. Because, Although we can identify developments about the concept itself or about related concepts in the history of the Frankfurt School, they remain embryonic. So I will not proceed from them. Rather, I propose to identify, dissociate, and recompose propositions concerning some notions such as normative expectations, deliberations, need, that were elaborated within critical theory. So by doing so, I'll be indirectly assessing critical theories' openness or vulnerability. 
to this concept, or better put, to this experience, the experience of vulnerability. So, I'll start by setting out the following definition. A vulnerability only ever arises at the hollow side of a power to act. It materializes only vis-a-vis -vis a power that either threatens to act or, on the contrary, fails to do so. To speak of vulnerability is to speak of an others or groups or structures power to act and clearly it does not exclude finding a power to act on the side of the vulnerable subject and this is important. <clears throat> What effectively illuminates, according to me, the notion of vulnerability is thus the idea of being at another's mercy. So that's my definition. So, vulnerability, as I understand it, is not a synonym for the uncertain, the always uncertain maintaining for life. <clears throat> While vulnerability to illness and accidents is undeniably in undeniably an inherent part of aging or the degeneration of the organic apparatus, I consider this kind of vulnerability only insofar as it may re-emerge as vulnerability to an absence of care, or lack of care. <clears throat> Condensing only vis-a-vis -vis a power to act, liable in response uh, for a form of protection which, as Horkheimer writes, is the archetype of domination, I quote. Vulnerability is always laden with possible political consequences. Yet, the political scope of vulnerability is almost unanimously uh, denied. It is very often perceived as somewhat lacking of virility, insofar as it is upheld by certain strands of feminists or as too Christian, insofar it is a recurrent motif of the gospel. And, it, and is cardinal for philosophers such as Paul Ricoeur or Simone Weil. So it seems to contain the risk of reducing politics to care, itself understood in, in the weakest sense as an urgent system to sustain lives, to not let people die, to preserve nature, the species, life. For this reason, Alain Badiou, for instance, <coughs> has taxed it with enabling the substitution of politics for ethics. It is, according to him, uh, <coughs> a sign of the intellectual indigence of our times and the attention paid to the body and the subject, insofar as they can be violated, is subtended by the idea that, I quote, the only thing that I can really happen to someone is death, unquote. Which amounts to admit the role of necessity and block the path to all emancipatory politics. So it is precisely in order to draw out the political significance of the experience of vulnerability, to inscribe it, if you like, in a philosophy of praxis, and thus, in this sense, to update critical theory, uh, that I'm going to devote myself to my exercise in entomology, again, to keep using the metaphor of dissection. <clears throat> so, critical theory man mainly developed two themes that could accommodate parts of the experience designated by the word vulnerability. That of need and that of suffering. Need also refers to a constitutive lack, like vulnerability, but is nonetheless distinguishable from it in many ways. It is, for example, object-oriented. Vulnerability, as for it, is oriented toward another subject. It immediately presupposes the existence of another. So, in, in other words, it is an essentially intersubjective category. Uh, in this, the category of vulnerability enables us to shift theoretical attention from the phenomenon, physical or psychological, toward the moral expectation surrounded it. And I will go back to, I will turn to this at length later. <clears throat> uh, but the fact remains that the, term, the theme of need has been 
uh, develop in um, political uh, has been de developed in a political direction, in particular in early Marx, and uh, uh, then uh, the critical uh, uh, theory has joined in this reflection. So what is interesting in this idea of need is precisely the fact that it was from the beginning uh, understood in order to uh, um, in, in, in a political purpose. Um, so very briefly here. Uh, Sorry, I, yeah. Uh, so need is a term under which the condition of threatening incompleteness comes to appear in the 1844 manuscripts. Here Marx defines man as a, as a being of needs dependent on something other than himself. And he considers that the place of need in capitalist society is ambivalent. On the one hand, production continually creates new needs. On the other, Capitalism alienates men's essential needs, which proceeds from the activation and confirmation of his essential force. <clears throat> so, um, th th uh, Theodore, I don't know, uh, 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 I will be very brief here, but uh, defended, uh, talked about needs, uh, and especially in, in, in a text which is called, and you must know it, Thesis on, Thesis on Needs. And, uh, he defended at length the idea that need is an always already social category. <clears throat> he also identified the considerable difficulties of a theory of need, difficulties incurred by the inscrutability of true and false needs. In one of the passages he devotes to this problem, he evokes a substitute question, a theoretical solution. The question of, I quote, the question of the immediate satisfaction of need is not to be posed in terms of social and natural, primary and secondary, correct and fails, rather it coincides with the question of the suffering of the vast majority of all humans in the earth. And here comes the second topic. So the Frankfurt School developed its epistemological and political stance on the basis of suffering, a stance that really leaves room for vulnerability and sees it as particularly pertinent to, so, to thought in its political scope. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, Adorno and Horkheimer developed a very specific concern for the suffering flesh, for the tiny, very fragile human body, as Benjamin put it, a concern that extends to the suffering of animals. On the other hand, critical theory, especially its first representatives, places suffering at the core of knowledge of and of politics, viewing it as a bridge between the two. <clears throat> From its epistemological status, suffering draws its political status because it presses towards social transformation. So I need to, to be brief here because it's a very well-known um, uh, part of the development of, especially of the first generation. Then, reflection on vulnerability as such gave rise to two successive developments at the end of the 20th century. First, a reflection on the human being as a mangled vision. And second, the idea of a fundamental vulnerability tied to a need for a recognition. And this is the second generation. <coughs> so uh, uh, the, the, um, first, uh, the topic of vulnerability appears as the idea of a sort of constitutive lake. The idea which originally referred to the human being's biological condition, was a conceptual stage to be surpassed. The imperfect matrix when an intersubjective conception of vulnerability should be born. Both Habermas and Honneth devote some of their early writings to German philosophical anthropology, whose representatives posited, albeit from different political perspectives, a human being characterizes by its vulnerability. Borrowing from Arnold Gelling, who described the human as open to the world, they apprehended a the human vulnerability that is not biological in nature. In other word terms, they both displaced Gelling's arguments onto another field of dangers, of perils, one inherent to a process of socialization and individualization. <clears throat> and this conception of a constitutive and nevertheless always already social vulnerability uh, later found an extension and thus also a displacement in both authors via a theory of recognition as exposure 
to injury. So um, vulnerability at that point becomes vulnerability to misrecognition. <clears throat> I quote uh, Hanet, human beings are vulnerable in that specific manner we call moral because they owe their identity to the construction of a practical self-relation that is dependent upon the help and affirmation of other human beings. Uh, <clears throat> Habermas and Hanet conserve of moral vulnerability through an uh, um, uh, homology with corporeal vulnerability, whereby they shift vulnerability in Galen's sense of incompletion onto that of a possible violation of some integrity. <clears throat> the Hanet uses the word vulnerability to designate the possibility of moral injuries, and I insist on injuries, that flow from the form of intersubjectivity of human life. And Ahamas uh, also uh, alludes to inner or symbolic injuries uh, to which we are especially cru cruelly exposed uh, since the relations as part of which they are inflicted are essential to the enfolding of our identity. So um, I, I leave this attempt aside, as I said at the beginning, uh, for several reasons. So I will not start from them. One, because they are too narrow according to my own project, the fact that I want to define vulnerability as living at the mercy. So they are too narrow, being limited to, to certain threats uh, to the constitution of the subject, in particular the moral subject, which is what is the core of the theory, <clears throat> and the relationship to oneself. And they cannot claim to account for the entirety of experiences that are today described as experiences of vulnerability as lives at the mercy of others. Two, they don't really allow to think about the continuity between bodily vulnerability and psychic vulnerability. Uh, <clears throat> in particular, bodily vulnerability is apprehended only as a modality of psychic vulnerability, <clears throat> and um, especially ro uh, rape, for instance, and in Hornet, is apprehended by Hornet, um, in terms of th a threat or the threat it represents to the psyche. So uh, I would say that the, the, the whole, what is, uh, the focus is what is threatened, not the way an, an entity, something is threatened, it's really uh, what is threatened, and it, it does not allow to see uh, the way uh, different uh, realities can be endangered in the same way. The focus is on what is exposed, instead of how this is exposed. And this is why I think it is necessary to, um, to, 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 to change the, fo the, the, the focus, um, especially because it also, it does not, in that case, if we focus on the way it was implemented by the Frankfurt School, it does not allow, for instance, to think about uh, uh, the vulnerability of the environment, for instance. It's, uh, it's really about the relationship to oneself and the constitution of the, of the subject. Uh, and there is a third reason which has been uh, uh, discussed at length uh, about 20 years ago, it has the fact that uh, it is linked to the motif of an exposed integrity, and this is especially uh, uh, true in Hannett's uh, theory. And it, it seems to, uh, to, ske to sketch a, fi uh, a finite and closed psychological identity, an objective reality defined by the fact that it has not been yet violated. <clears throat> so instead of trying to put a new spin on these attempts, I am going to reconstruct an idea of vulnerability, one that enables an articulation with the political, that is not limited to the institution, to the institutional implementation of moral principles. So this is very important. I don't just want to talk about vulnerability is that in as much as the state should take care of it. It's not the, it's not the point. This exercise, thinking the implementation, is perfectly legitimate and des desirable at a normative level, for sure. It has given rise to numerous theori theorizations of the state, the welfare state, evaluation of policies, etc., etc., by such brilliant thinkers as Robert Castell, Robert Godin, Martin Nussbaum, care ethics uh, theoricians, etc., etc. <clears throat> Uh, but sometimes this comes down to viewing vulnerability solely as a problem to be dealt with by institutions. And I would like to bring to light the always already political texture of the experience of vulnerability and to draw the consequences. <clears throat> 
Uh, one promising approach, I believe, uh, lies in the idea of normative expectations, such as it has been developed by critical theory. So, um, it seems to me that recourse to the idea of vulnerability presupposes a moral evaluation. Vulnerability uh, would appear only insofar as it entails a horizon of obligations that might be fulfilled or not, but that are perceived by someone and, as a rule, by one who makes use of the term. So, <clears throat> Uh, so there is, it entails a horizon of obligation, of normative reasoning, and of political arrangements and discourses. It enjoins us to a form of action, of protection, of care, an injection that can be addressed to institutions, as I said, to a particular group, to the juridical system, to anyone at all. Lastly, it can be uh, accompanied by the disapproval of those who take advantage of the fragility such uh, thus formed. So in each society, these moral evaluations proceed to a division between, on the one hand, acceptable exposure to the world and the intolerable receptiveness to the other's arbitrariness. So I suggest that the, uh, the, the idea of normative expectation, uh, such, such that it has been developed within critical theory, makes it precisely possible to envision vulnerability as something that appears only at the same time as a horizon of obligation and as materializing rights at the level of social interaction. <coughs> the, this definition enables us to suspend, and this is important to me, uh, in, in circumscribing with vulnerability the question uh, of the possible effect that breaches of expectation may have on our psyches. This is not what I try to do. Uh, so what I want to say is that the, 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 the scene that units a power of acting, which either threatens to exert itself or else falls to do so, and the vulnerability arising from it is instituted, and there will be uh, something about this idea of uh, institution, by expectation. So exposure is permitted and shaped by normative expectations that are situated between subjects. <clears throat> normative expectations bear on which is due to me, either from others or from the community of which I am a member, a due cut from the weft of a mutuality, a generality, or even a necessary universality. Normative expectations involve personal aspiration as much as expectation of a just and or good social arrangement. Further, they, fre they frequently take the form when expressed, which is to say when they fail, of feelings of injustice. This is what Hornet wrote. Uh, they are the site of which we are experiencing the failure to live up to expectation of justice in the social order, and in light of their disappointment, the person who is the subject of this breach can elaborate a demand for justice. Uh, the founded character uh, they are attributed resides in the fact that many people, myself included, are obliged to honor them or feel obliged to honor it. In other terms, and this is what Habermas claimed, the rest on the supposition or demand of a norm. <clears throat> uh, moreover, these expectations do not reside at an afro linguistic level, although they are not necessarily conscious, uh, prior to struggling uh, with the reality that resists them. And so there is also a last component that, that ought to be mentioned. Uh, orienting oneself around the normative expectation of the other means including this other in the circle of those whom I owe something, in the community of persons with rights to a moral status. So I, I have to, to, to cut here, but uh, what I want to, to highlight is the fact that we are not dealing with two juxtaposed mental phenomena. This is my point. Uh, that may attempt to, to adapt to, to one or another. We are not in, in, in front of a scene of confrontation between the power of acting and the vulnerability, a scene that would be illuminated uh, by the, the notion of normative expectation. Really, this scene is instituted 
by uh, uh, normative expectations. So it's not a kind of context, it's more, it's, it makes the whole scene possible. Uh, so here I have to cut, I think. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I will be, I will elaborate this during the question, I guess, because I have no time. But I, in order to think about institutions, I need to borrow from uh, Castoriadis, uh, even though uh, I know that there are issues of compatibility between uh, the Frankfurt School and Castoriadis. But I can reply to the to the possible question that may be raised later on. But I really think that uh, uh, thinking normative expectation. Uh, as an institution precisely allows to think about this intersubjective inter level that lacked in his writings. And, uh, but, so, um, but what I want to, 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 to highlight is it here is that by defining a normative expectation as an institution, it then becomes possible to draw out several of its characteristics uh, for vulnerability. And this is where I am aiming. Uh, <coughs> Uh, institutions presupposes consistency, uh, they, they presuppose unavailability, uh, they uh, presuppose the activation of a register of constraints, uh, and, uh, and, and, and they, 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 they are a site of appropriations of norms insofar as they concern me, insofar as I can lay claim to them. So what does it mean? If it, is, it is now possible to observe how vulnerability institutions and normative expectation are all linked. One, by instituting condition of interaction, normative interaction, institute and maintain the individual in the social. Two, to determine the individual status as a subject, in particular as a moral and political subject. And three, the institute that to which the individual is exposed. In other terms, vulnerability is a condition of possibility of the subject. Because seizing a subject in expectation simultaneously means exposing it to the possibility of being let down. So here are now some consequences, further consequences. Insofar as normative expectation institute that to which one is exposed, vulnerability cannot be conceived as a state tied to one plane of human existence, such as the psychic plane, for instance, or bodily plane, uh, more uh, <clears throat> rarely does uh, vulnerability uh, even stick within these limits of a single one of these planes. Here I would, I would like to uh, uh, quote Adriana Cavarero, who for instance uh, describes the suicide attacks that characterize the horizon of our times as seeking to destroy bodies as much as to infringe their unicity by disfiguring them and completely dismembering them thereby affecting the human condition in general. Another example, in our work on collective violence in India, Vinadas, sheds light on the way in which uh, some affronts against bodies, effects breaks with every bring together, and also work to threaten the very idea of everyday life, which once such violence is experienced. Um, <clears throat> So there is, there is always this form of continuity between different planes, levels, forms of vulnerability that must be taken in consideration and that can, if we use this idea of, of uh, normative expectation. Um, one aspect, which is minor, but I want to, to highlight here is the fact that the reality of normative, <coughs> if the reality of normative expectation is instituting as much as instituted, which is what I try to show with, with Castoriadis, the vulnerability that they compress can be thought of only as always already social. So uh, we get rid here of the always uh, ontological concern uh, that surrounds the very use of idea of vulnerability. So now, let me try with this to go to uh, my political point. Uh, let me now think the political scope of vulnerability in a way that cannot be reduced to the institutional implementation of moral principles. That was what I, 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 I So I understand in a very French way maybe 
and maybe you won't uh, agree with that, but I understand the political as a site of a specific power and action, as a specific mode, one might say. Uh, it can materialize in different ways. A, it coincides with a sphere of deliberation. It, two, it is averred when a political subjectivity appears. And C, it is the space of emergence of a peculiar common. Uh, these are different propositions, but I would like to show that actually the idea of vulnerability, I mean the experience of vulnerability, allows the emergence of all those modes of, of, of the political. So, um, uh, so, for some of those dimensions, the work of articulation between the political and vulnerability has already been done by critical theory, and uh, the other requires formulation through new hypotheses, and again, here I will borrow from let's say French uh, philosophy mostly, and or feminist philosophy, and sometimes French uh, uh, feminist philosophy. So A, deliberation, this is the easiest part. Uh, in, that, in that, according to that mode, there is a political, uh, wherever we, s we see emerge public deliberations, controversies in the public sphere, and clays made in some specific or <clears throat> in some capacity or other by the individuals concerned and or by their spokesmen. In critical theory, the articulation of vulnerability and this deliberative conception of the political seems to me to have been accomplished uh, uh, already. Nancy Fraser does it via the thematics of needs and the struggle for the interpretations and Habermas too, borrowing from Nancy Fraser. Uh, even though it's a different viewpoint. Um, certainly, as I explained in the introduction, we cannot go from the idea of vulnerability to the concept of needs without simplifying issues somewhat. In order to translate these arguments about needs into the vocabulary of vulnerability, we must view lack and threat as constituted by normative expectations. <laughs> Since expectations are what institute that to which one is exposed, uh, the political gets materialized in the discussion about the social perception of vulnerability, about what counts as exposure and what, by contrast, appears to belong to fate. Uh, from this point of view, uh, Fraser, uh, Nancy Fraser and Linda Gordon's reflection on the US uses of a neighboring concept, dependence, is illuminating. Um, that, that, that's a writing from the late eight, uh, 1980s and uh, describing the, the, the emergence at the end of the 20th century uh, of, the, of this, uh, of this uh, new register of the idea of dependence uh, as a moral or psychological register. Uh, they highlight uh, a historical transformation of what gets collectively apprehended as a wrong of what is considered the appropriate object of political attention and social concern. So, more precisely, I think, when we focus on the idea of vulnerability, um, I think that the, the political uh, uh, exists or perseveres by establishing the threshold between the normative expectations that behove public reason and that, therefore, will likely, in a second phase, be the subject of political and or juridical arrangement, and those that will continue to escape public reason. <clears throat> Doing justice to the problematic of vulnerability in politics uh, is not about taking up all of its manifestation, and I want to, 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 to insist on that. Um, some expectations are sayable, are sayable publicly, others are not, and some responses have to efface themselves as such in order to reach their goal. And this is what is uh, very peculiar about vulnerability, especially if you work with care ethics, uh, they, they have hi highlighted the, the kind of delicacy that the fact of taking uh, uh, um, care of some vulnerability sometimes um, implies to be discreet in a way that the political does not allow this kind of uh, privateness, discreetness, etc., etc. And in particular, there is a, this French uh, sociologist, Pascal Molinier, who, who worked a lot in, uh, in uh, nursing homes. He talked a lot about the fact that sometimes taking care uh, of a vulnerability means 
again, erasing the traces of this care. So it's totally incompatible with, with, uh, with, with politics. So it is always a, a way of discussing where is the social, when does some kind of uh, exposure uh, uh, are to be said by, by, by the political. Um, and there are also some kind of vulnerability that we don't want uh, to, uh, to become political. One of the uh, uh, a famous example I used to to, uh, to use this idea of love. One of the f one of the biggest vulnerability we can experience in our uh, in our life is the vulnerability to break up, to lose someone you love, etc., etc. And we don't want, I guess, but most of us don't want that to allow some kind of ban of the divorce of of love breakups. Of course, so it means that. All, not all kind of vulnerability has to be said by the political, but deciding what is political or not is itself political. That's the point. And maybe that, uh, it's not to say that there is nothing political in love, but that it has to be discussed. And for instance, um, the recent book by Eva Luz, you might know, The End of Love. Uh, here you have a kind of uh, reflection about the fact that, well, the breakups should not be understood uh, maybe anymore in our capitalistic Tinder way of behaving in relationship should not be understood anymore as something that is related to fate, to the fact that just the other one just stopped loving you and you cannot do anything. But maybe there is something political behind that. Maybe that in this game of falling in love and, and breaking up, maybe there is a very strong, uh, let's say, male advantage that basically might... We might uh, lead to a rediscussion about what is vulnerability, vulnerability even in love, and what we should do about it. I'm quite sure that Eva, Eva Luz not, would not argue for the ban of divorce, but still, something might be, might be becoming political here, even in love. So, I'll, I'll leave it here. Uh, so there is this question of public say, sayability uh, that is at stake in, 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 in the... In, in the in the political, when it says, when it's, it's apparent, it's uh, it apparent uh, uh, vulnerability. Okay. Thank you. Uh, political subjectivity. Uh, thinking together, uh, political subjectivation and vulnerability <laughs> implies that a vulnerability cannot become a legitimate object of government unless its definition, its contours, and the means of its care undergo an elaboration and a discussion by uh, the subject who are affected or have been affected by this form of exposure. So this is not an argument that can simply be brushed aside by countering that it contains an intolerable uh, <coughs> injunction. Uh, for this condition is what enables us to avoid reducing political subjects to moral agents whose interactions and cooperation are circumscribed to the non realization of moral obligation and or to subject of the political. <clears throat> In other terms, for, from a political perspective, the fulfillment of a need can arise only from the fulfillment of a demand whose claim to validity will have been recognized after a process wherein, wherein validity requirements are satisfied after the relevant reasons, etc., etc. So the, the sign that a vulnerability has been responded to and not simply the condition under which an adequate, an adequate response is found for it is that justice is done to a voice. Okay? Um, so it, uh, uh, taking care of vulnerability uh, uh, is uh, or necessarily, if it has to be political, uh, it has to be a, a, a reply to a demand, to a claim. Uh, so that might seem an arrogant demand addressed to individuals exposed to harmful events. Uh, but I think that I, I just want to recall uh, that I have attempted before to show that uh, um, the vulnerability is not a question of incapacity. Um, uh, it, it is a, a, a question of, of a situation, really. Uh, it's neither incompetence nor incapacity. It is an exposure to the disappointment of normative expectation, again. <clears throat> Uh, but that's only the first point I want to make. That is, political subjectivation means that actually uh, a voice must arise. But it's not only that. There is 
the idea of political subjectivation, such as it has been work, notably in the French tradition, but not only. It, it, it presumes a process of self-transformation of the subject concerned, a process that occurs through a, a reorganization of the, of the experiential field. And here, maybe, maybe, <coughs> Critical theory lacks example of fully elaborated connection between the concept of political subjectivation and vulnerability. Uh, in, order, in, a, in Axel Honneth's work, the subject can discover herself the bureau of normative expectations, so uh, limited to a rec expectation of recognition, you might recall, by experiencing the way that structures of interaction bridge them. The experience of vulnerability is what thus brings about the subject's cognizance of the moral stakes uh, substanding her action, and this experience determines her possible passage to a struggle. Uh, so, in other, um, in other words, the lived experience of injustice has a specific cognitive content. So, transformation has to do here with learning, with consciousness, uh, with, with the rise of a consciousness. Uh, in order then the process of political subjectivation coincides with a refrigeration of the subject's concerned knowledge. But I, want, I would like to make this point. The experience of vulnerability is often a very familiar one, who causes consequences, whose causes, consequences and injustice are always already well known. The disappointment of many normative expectations comes as absolutely no surprise and leads to no new consciousness. Let me briefly evoke Simone de Beauvoir and her description, under a different name, of the female experience of vulnerability in Le Deuxième Sex. I guess in English it's the second sex, I guess. <clears throat> According to her, from puberty onward, women experience their body as, I quote, the potential object of another subject's intention of manipulation, end quote, a body at the mercy of other bodies, to put it in my own words. <clears throat> They experience their body as a thing rather than a tool for achieving their ends, something to be dragged, pushed, but also protected. And this knowledge of their exposure is precisely the mainspring of their powerlessness, translating into a more general timidity. I quote, she does not dare to be enterprising, to revolt, to invent. So subjectivation, and even more, political subjectivation is a blocked path precisely because of the knowledge of exposure. And she makes a difference between the adolescent boy uh, who is allowed to manifest itself imperiously and uh, the, 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 the girl who actually uh, does not manage to think of, her, of herself as, as, a, as a subject. Uh, <clears throat> so according to me, uh, thinking about the political subjectiv uh, um, subjectivation uh, made, the experience, made possible by the experience of vulnerability implies abandoning what I would call the cognitive paradigm <clears throat> and taking into consideration that it presupposes a capacity, I mean this subjectivation, a capaci capacity to modify the state of the world, which might be uh, uh, defined as, a, as, a decenter, as an ability to decenter or affect the other. <clears throat> In, other, in this view, the process of political subjectivation does not coincide with the becoming conscious and speaking out of an entity that would pre-exist this confrontation, but is effectuated through a series of operations involving the production of a new field of experience, operation with which it remains coextensive. And for this task, and I will st st stop here, I think that Jacques Rancière might be a valuable resource. But I want to go to my last point. The common. So the common is also the site of emergence of a regime of specific social relations. Out of a particular link between humans, one not derivable from any other logic of association, whether cultural, economic, or even juridical. Being in common results mechanic mechanistically from the functional of the political, in that case. Uh, the common proper to the political 
uh, is and uh, is envisaged apprehended in much contemporary political theory um, on the basis of two different processes, uh, or maybe at the intersection of both of them. Its emergence is held to proceed from a phenomenon of learning, which is different from the consciousness I was, uh, I was, uh, I was mentioning, I'm, I'm going to explain, and all the experience of disagreement. So, first, frequent analyses have been undertaken, notably <coughs> among recent uh, uh, theorician of deliberative uh, democracy, uh, I would quote uh, Habermas, of course, by Iris Marion Young, and today's numerous uses of the way, definition of politics as experimentation. So there are many uh, attempts to, um, uh, to, to, to uh, apprehend the, the development of a new, a different way of relating to others in the public sphere via the prism of the, of the, pro of the process of transformation of individual uh, uh, preferences uh, as it occurs in the course of deliberation itself, of learning something from the other, the other point of view. The general argument generally sets out from the idea that deliberation is also a procedure for gathering information about the other, etc., etc. Uh, there is this idea of a reflexivity inherent to the political, uh, which operates at the collective as well as at the individual level. So that's that, let's say the learning process, some, there is something which is at stake during the deliberation which has to do with learning something about the situation, about the other's point of view, etc., etc. That's one common way of thinking about a new common that appears. The other way, it's uh, um, from, that can be found in many authors too, from Arendt to the representative of current agonism, let's say, dealt with the emergence of a political together uh, build, built in, in, in precisely in the experience of disagreement. Uh, it's, it's, so it's, uh, the political is not the, the, uh, the, 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 the sphere of the settlement of disagreement, but of the permanence of, uh, of disagreement. And it's being together by, being, uh, by, by, by disagreeing. So, working further the thread of the common that is proper to the political, we are compelled to consider the following. Political being together produces its own epistemic conditions, which have practical effects bringing the individuals that they affect to relate to one another in a particular way. So, articulating the political with vulnerability thus involves confronting these conditions with the exposure, sorry, with the experience, the experience of exposure and lack. Uh, uh, briefly, uh, I think that uh, uh, Honet, uh, uh, in a way, makes two different, or maybe like has two different uh, claims when it, when it comes to uh, explaining uh, what I, what's going on when your normative expectation uh, is an infant field. Uh, one, you learn something about yourself, about the fact that you had, you had expectations, and two, this is the motivation to start a struggle sometimes. That's the point. Now, there is something that th the theories of intersectionality have recently made clear, at least through the voice of Bell Hooks. The intertreatment of the different axes of injustice and exposure to wrongs, uh, uh, yeah, the, they made clear the intertreatment of the different axes of injustice and exposure to wrongs, and not all of them necessarily affect me. Gender, race, and place, in class to reiterate the forms of nudity to, harm, to harmful uh, events and types of exploitation of vulnerability in which our thought is rooted are not endogenous realities able to influence each other in a second phase. They are bound up in process of construction. Now, if some persons are exposed to all these wrongs conjointly, these persons who only experience, the person who only experiences a single vulnerability or a small number of them tend to be more numerous. Bell Hooks agrees with Honet that most human beings only feel summoned to political action insofar as they seek to put an end to that which injures them. But according to her, pre pre precisely here lies the problem. For it means that aspiration for change in general aims only at what affects us and so misses the reality of domination, which again is always already mixed, which is necessarily complex and necessarily entangled with all the axes of injustice 
that do not concern me directly. In other terms, what Bell Hooks tends to demonstrate is that what motivates political action is not that which sheds light on. So there is a, a way to distinguish between those two elements in the Hornet's uh, reflection. Uh, <clears throat> so now political uh, struggle can only, must only, aim at destroying all axes of domination and exposure at the same time, according to the intersectionality paradigm. Uh, because if only one of them dis uh, disappears, then the whole structure will stay. Uh, I would thus like to defend the idea that the common proper to the political might result from the constraint to let go of something of one's experience of vulnerability, thanks maybe to the resistance that others oppose to one's interpretation of it. The experience of vulnerability has no political efficacy on the world unless it affects, it affects decentering, which is to say the partial abandoning of a posture and a claim, a decentering carried out via the text of disagreement and that enforces a learning process. And I'm done uh, with my uh, conclusion. Uh, but, yeah. So far from being irreconcilable with the political, the idea of vulnerability sheds new light on it. Thinking the political through the prism of vulnerability defined as an exposure to another's power to act, an exposure organized by normative expectations, with as much institu instituting force as instituted form, implies its coinciding with the conjunct advent of a world, a relation, and a political subject. Our reflection, I believe, I hope, has demonstrated uh, a world arising from deliberation, a political subjectivity, and a relation between political subjects, the emergence of which depends upon the experience of living at the other's mercy. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to comment on Estelle's work, which is an inspiration uh, for, has been and is for many of us who think about the de further development of critical theory. In her lecture, Estelle reconstructs a notion of vulnerability that is not primarily understood as moral or psychological. Rather, she aims at a political conception of vulnerability. In pursuit of this enterprise, she seeks to find a way to do justice to what Adorno once called a, a condition of all truth, Leiden bereit werden zu lassen, to lend a voice to suffering as it manifests, suffering manifests a form of negative objectivity that haunts the subject. In my remarks, I want to ask four questions which might help us to think further about critical theory along the lines Estelle suggests. So the first question is about the definition of vulnerability. Estelle's favorite structural definition is being at another's mercy. That power-based definition of what is properly called domination allows for an analysis, I think, of objective vulnerabilities, which may not yet have been perceived or thematized by those subject to them. Hence, there is no experience of vulnerability yet. And maybe there isn't even a language for identifying the vulnerability. Think here of Miranda Fricker's notion of hermeneutical injustice. So this is what we might expect critical theory to address. Yet, it seems to be in tension with an understanding of vulnerability as a subjective experience and a perceived harmful event, as Estelle argues. 
So here's my first question. How do the structural and the subjective experiential dimension of vulnerability, dimensions of vulnerability relate to one another? Can we have the first without the second? Here's my second question. How true, viva, is the language of feelings and experiences of vulnerability? How about, for example, the patriarch who feels disrespected and disappointed and hurt by being ignored? How about the xenophobe who fears that the Heimat is being sold out to foreigners and so on? Or the woman who feels vulnerable, think of Beauvoir's example, and weak and seeks protection by men who kindly offer that as a form of domination? So here's the second question. Can experiences of vulnerability be false and ideologically produced? For both of these questions, the moral dimension of Estelle's account is most important. But here my third question arises, namely how the specter of conventionalism can be avoided. To explain, vulnerability appears in Estelle's view only, you saw that on the slides, insofar as there is a social and moral horizon of institutionalized obligations within what she calls a normative order. That order, quote, is the site where we experience the failure to live up to expectations of justice in the social order, and in light of their disappointment, the person who is the subject of this breach can elaborate a demand for justice, end of quote. So the existing framework of social understandings of justice and injustice of what is due to me is the basis for emancipatory demands. And Estelle seems to suggest, therefore, and here's my question whether she does, a quasi-Hegelian notion of instituted morality that serves as the ground for what kind of critiques of vulnerabilities are possible, are visible, and can be addressed, because they have to be addressed on the basis of socially institutionalized expectations of, of what you deserve, what is due to you. I am, and I can be, therefore, only what these norms allowed me to be, ideally speaking, if my vulnerability was exposed and overcome. But the language in which I can address the vulnerability is the socially instituted language of justice. There is no way to go further than that. So here's my question. What if the ganze is das unwahre? What if the sittlichkeit of the given normative order is determined by racism, patriarchal norms, homo and xenophobia, by class bias, and all kinds of other legitimations of domination. What if, as Adorno says in negative dialectics, the vorgängige Allgemeinheit, the existing generality, I, I translate the existing normative order, Hegel's objective spirit, is unwahr, weil ihre Vernunft noch keine ist, ihre Allgemeinheit Produkt particularen Interesses false, because its reason is not yet reason. Its generality is merely the product of particular interest. Now, I won't rehearse the arguments against neo-Hegelian notions of normative imminence at this point, as I think that no existing normative order für sich can help us to rationally identify which of its parts are progressive and which are regressive, or whether it contains anything progressive at all. We are, after all, in a building built for and by the IG Farben complex. Such evaluation, in brief, has to come from a normative force called critical reason to identify what Adorno called the Unvernunft der herrschenden Vernunft. This is why, to answer all of my three questions, that of first, non-visible vulnerabilities, that of false vulnerabilities, and that of the moral evaluation of vulnerabilities, I think that 
a critical theory of normative orders has to have a double side and regard a normative order of justifications or of social imaginaries, whatever you prefer, both as one of given, possibly ideological justifications guiding social action, and as containing, normatively speaking, the right, and if things go well and there's a crack in the social order, the possibility of all understanding themselves as equals to be able and justified to radically reject given justifications and demand better ones. That act of saying no, I think, already is the major step towards emancipation. I believe that this is quite in line with Estelle's approach, especially if you think of the three points about the political she made at the end. For she does not want to rely on a conventionalist form of Sittlichkeit or normative order, but rather on a transformative notion. But how can we account for the self-transformation, quote, that replaces a conventional vulnerability, like, ah, oh, you poor thing, let me help you, with another transformative one, answering, I'm not weak, you just imposed a status of fabricated weakness on me. What are the normative resources in a given normative order to transcend the given social imaginary, both with respect to subject constitution and normative reasoning? Quick force point, the role of social theory, surely an issue for our conference here. I consider it an essential aspect of critical theory, Frankfurt School style, that the critical consciousness at work in struggles for emancipation requires theoretical enlightenment. To lend, and Stefan mentioned it in his introductory remarks, to lend a voice to suffering also means to make its objective nature visible. When Adorno talks about the non-identical impulse required to free the subject from the impositions of dominating identity thinking, he also adds, wahre Praxis, der Inbegriff von Handlungen, welche der Idee von Freiheit genügten, bedarf des vollen theoretischen Bewusstseins. True practice, realizing freedom, requires full theoretical consciousness. Estelle touches on this at the very end when she argues that theories of intersectionality made clear the intertwinement, quote, of the different axes of injustice and exposure to wrongs. I take this insight into what she calls the reality of domination to be one for which we need a comprehensive form of social theory. As Estelle rightly points out, that most of the time, people only regard their own vulnerability as they perceive it as important and tend to ignore or even downgrade the vulnerability of others. Think of the migration debate today and in earlier times. To understand the full reality of domination, the intersectional reality of domination, we require, it seems, a comprehensive social theory which is strong enough, as Adorno argues in his 1967 talk on right-wing radicalism, to demystify ideologies on the basis of a wirklich unideologische Wahrheit, a truly non-ideological truth, and with the durchschlagende Kraft der Vernunft, the trumping power of reason. So here's my fourth question to Estelle and to all of us. Will we, at this conference, or at any time, find the means to work towards such a comprehensive theory? And to do so, do we believe in its possibility? I hope so. Many thanks. Thank you uh, very much, Rainer, for these massive questions. Uh, I will, uh, I, I'm, I'm grateful that the last one uh, can be replied by other people than me, so <laughs> at least that's a relief. Uh, so let me reply to uh, your question about experience. Okay, so first, 
and you draw my attention to it, and I had not paid, um, I mean, I did not notice that before. Actually, in French, and this is my translator who, for some reason, took some liberty, he heard some, but I, I, my, my formulation is living at the mercy and not being at the mercy, and that changed everything, and now I understand why you don't see my experiential point, I think. So that's for one thing. Um, but I have a more substantive reply uh, beyond that. Um, yeah, in French it's vivre à la merci. Uh, so. But still, I really have the feeling that uh, the idea of vulnerability that actually has gained uh, so much preeminence in the last decade, maybe, 15 years, uh, it has gained all this preeminence precisely because it uh, describes an experience. Because if we are only talking about the objective situation, that could have been described and that was described in other times with other words, such as domination, exploitation, many other words. And for some reason, at some point, the need was felt to describe what is going on, let's say, uh, in, a, in, a, in a factory uh, between, I mean, the boss and the employee, under the term vulnerability. And here, you have something which is felt, I, I, as I understand it, and which actually called uh, the very idea of in, uh, vulnerability, such as it is now everywhere. So there is this uh, lived uh, texture, let's say, of exploitation, domination, which is, according to me, immanent to the idea of vulnerability. That's my reply to the first question. The second one is very easy. Of course, there are... Uh, especially because now it has become such a prominent grammar, there are fails and ideological use, uses of the idea of vulnerability. Uh, let me give one example we have in, in France, and I guess you have the same here. Uh, the, you have a movement of uh, divorced fathers that actually are, well, uh, how could I say, some kind of masculinist in disguise. Uh, and in order to uh, get their, the custody of their children, they use very strongly the idea of vulnerability. They are the vulnerable f fathers who are the prey of the um, raging feminism, and because of that, they suffer in their heart and in their family, etc. Et so that's an example, but I'm sure that you will find uh, many other examples. And especially because vulnerability is very often used in order to assess a certain ranking of vulnerabilities, as you, and as you said, you mentioned, I mean, uh, what is going on in, 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 the, in the Mediterranean Sea right now, uh, which tends to be forgotten or uh, put aside uh, on the benefit of some, let's say, or lower white classes issues we have in Europe, for instance. So, of course. That's, that's for sure. Uh, now comes a very difficult one. Uh, what transformed the given social imaginary? So first I want to, 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 to stand on my ground and I really do believe that uh, if we use properly the idea of vulnerability, it means that some, we think that first something can be impeded, prevented. I mean, the, the disaster has not happened yet. You are vulnerable and that not something can be done and something should be done. So it's a moral evaluation. That's, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, necessary, which means that actually it's not so much an objective situation than a moral evaluation and a moral discourse on what is going on. Uh, let's, there is, a, for instance, today, uh, the typical group for which we will use the idea of vulnerability will be the elderly. Okay, vulnerable people in nursing homes, people who are uh, exposed to many kind of, I don't know, uh, violence, absence of care, anything, any okay, so that is typical. Uh, I don't know if you know, or if you remember this um, movie, uh, which is uh, in English, I think it's uh, The Ballad of Narayama. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a movie that uh, must have been done in the 80s. Uh, by Imamura, which is a Jap uh, Japanese uh, uh, um, uh, um, movie maker. Uh, and in this, in this uh, uh, movie, you have elderly people 
Donc, it's, it's in the medieval Japan. Uh, there is this uh, tradition that when they pass 70, the elderly of a village, because there's not enough to, to eat for the whole village, they go in the mountain in order to starve, in order to let the, the village survive. So they just go in the mountain, in the, in the snow, and they break their teeth with a stone in order to, to, to make the death quicker so that they are not tempted, I don't know, to eat some grass, or I don't know. So it's, it's very brutal. But my point is that actually, at that time, or even, no, I mean, you would not call them vulnerable, even though uh, they are vulnerable to violence. In that, in today we would say vulnerable to violence, to indifference, to uh, lack of care, whatever, but that's in that case. So I really want to say that it's, it has to do with uh, a moral evaluation, which, is, which appears at a certain period. So uh, uh, there, there is uh, uh, something which must be instituted that makes some situation unacceptable or not. Now, of course, there is a question that you raise, which is a huge one that goes much beyond what I try to do, which is where is the pressing point? Uh, how do you transcend the given social reality? Uh, so, of course, you can see that there are historical processes, uh, there are cumulative processes. One becomes uh, more and more uh, keen of raising some kind of claims because related claims were made by previous generations. Uh, and for instance, we are uh, um, talking about the fact that uh, uh, the idea of vulnerability uh, has appeared uh, in 15 years ago, maybe. And maybe this translates, uh, or this is an expression of uh, the fact that the idea of uh, agency has become uh, more and more pregnant. Uh, the fact that uh, living at the mercy means that you feel the experience a discrepancy between two agencies, and yours is not enough to resist uh, the, 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 the other's agency. Uh, but that means that I do have an agency, and I am aware of it, and in a way I, am, I experience, uh, in a way, the, 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 my, my inability to, 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 to react. But so the very idea of agency is, is clear, is uh, accepted, and is the, um, the, the core from which I have those expectations. I, I, I know that I could or I should. And so this is obviously built into a certain uh, rise of the, of the, of, of the idea of, su of the subject, of course, but of its generalization and the fact that, for instance, women more and more uh, tend to think of themselves as subject. And this is something that has changed, of course. So, uh, so there, is, there are some, of course, more uh, cumulative processes, but we know that cumulative processes can also go the other way. Uh, so I, I, I would say, and maybe in that we have, we, have, uh, we have something in common, that is there is something that lies within justification and deliberation uh, that... Uh, that um, forces us to give reasons uh, to, uh, uh, yeah, to, to claim something for some reason that can be regarded as a good reason by others and things like that. So, of course, uh, language can be the place and is the place of a lot of violence and, and disturbances and everything and distortions. But there is something I believe in the very process of justification that we all both believe in. Uh, and then the reality of, uh, can we have a, a theory of the, of the reality of, uh, of domination? I hope so. And this is why I'm going to listen to you uh, today uh, and to listen to the other propositions that will be made. Thank you very much, Rainer. Thank you very much, Estelle, for your insightful talk and your, from my point of view, very convincing conception of vulnerability, and Raina for your comments as well and questions. So the first floor is open to, uh, for discussion. Uh, we have some questions, and you, of course, also have the, still the possibility to react to the response, but there is already a first question. <laughs> 
Thank you, Estelle, for the talk, and thank you, Rhino, for uh, the comments. Um, my name is Jörg. Um, the, um, I, I have a question about your answer to Rhino's second question. I'm not really sure if you answer it, it in a certain way. Um, you mentioned, so Rhino talked about the truth of feelings. I'm not quite sure if I want to use the term of truth of feelings, but you invoked an example of once the, the, the fathers portraying themselves as vulnerable in these custody battles. And, and so there seems to be the underlying thought here, there's something inappropriate or phony about the invocation of vulnerability. And I would really like to hear more about how you can criticize or defend people that invoke vulnerability. How would that look like? So as soon as vulnerability is one of the things we invoke, we need to sort of ask ourselves, how can we critically in interrogate that in the defense or in the undermining? And so I think that's, the direction in which Reiner's question was going, not just an example, but how do we actually critically evaluate claims of vulnerability and how would that look like? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yes, uh, my, my point was that it was not about the fact that there was a certain fashion of talking about vulnerability. It was, it was really uh, uh, something that uh, tend to uh, deny uh, the fact that the feeling of vulnerability would be uh, um, enough to, uh, to, some, to, to, to legitimate or to, to justify some kind of claims. That, so we are, we are on the same page here. Now, how can I criticize? I mean, are, are, again, uh, this is why I insisted so much on the political. It's not only me as a theorician, but I think this is why I, I think it's so important that our experiences of, of, uh, of vulnerability uh, go through the trial of the political. Precisely, I mean, and here I understand there are, there are also some dangers because for some people it's not very easy to be listened. But at the same time, uh, the very fact that your claim uh, for uh, your self-identification self as vulnerable and the fact that this triggers or should trigger some kind of care, let's say, or, or, or policies or whatever, uh, this should go to some kind of uh, discussion, deliberation, confrontation between all the claims of vulnerability. And, uh, uh, and as I said, to me, it's important that at some point we, we all let go part of our claim. And this is the way it can work, and precisely on the basis of a deliberation that can be completely distorted. And this is another issue. That there are some people who just... Uh, are not able to be heard, and then there's the issue of how do you build a new language, how can this new language be heard, but that's not, I mean, I, I can have a history of society um, for 20 decades, but uh, yeah, I really think that there's something in the political that we would call the, the, the trial, that means that actually a claim has to be uh, examined, has to be, has to go through some uh, yeah, examinations by the others, and uh, as such, the feeling of vulnerability is not enough. I would briefly, if I may, uh, just add one question, because I was very, I thought it was very interesting that you picked up the idea from Simone de Beauvoir and the blocked path of political subjectivity, and then in the end, you, it led to, uh, to the idea of letting go of some experiences of vulnerability in the part of the political process, if I got you right. Mm. Could you please elaborate? Because my question is also guided by the idea, I mean, we have developed in a long process of discussion in the last year, research perspectives for the EFS, and there is, um, we formulated in the idea that we're in also in search of a theory, or a theory as uh, Stefan has outlined, not only for theory of crisis, but also for a theory of practice, practice theory. And if this letting go experience is part of political action, how would you, could you pl please elaborate on that? Yeah, I think that there are two different uh, levels or moments here. I mean, uh, I used Beauvoir in order to, as I said, call for the, uh, the, 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 the abandonment of this, what I call cognitive paradigm, in order to understand what is going on when your, uh, experience, uh, your expectations are not met. I think that in most cases, we perfectly know that we had expectations and they were, that they were bound 
to not to be met. So th this is particular. And the, uh, what uh, Beauvoir made clear is that it's not just that you knew, but precisely it's on the basis of the, of this knowledge that for girls, women, it is impossible or very difficult to become a political subject, precisely because you know that anyway, uh, 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 you, uh, all your claims will, will fail or something like that. So uh, that's one part. So knowing is not the first step uh, to struggle, because according to me, knowledge is always already here. So, and again, because you are, and I think that in a, uh, in a way, uh, uh, Adorno said something like that in a, in a, in a paper uh, where he talks about um, uh, impotent, impotency. It's in a paper which is called uh, on, uh, about uh, class th theory or something like that. And there he talks about the fact that the proletariat uh, knows perfectly well the processes and dispositives of which it is victim, and though nothing changes, something like that. So I really think that if we need to think about what is uh, power, what is political action, what is effect on the world, we should not start from the question of knowing because this knowledge is always already here. In most of us, I mean, sometimes you can have like a kind of a epiphany, oh my God, I, I was dominated from the beginning, but I don't think it's happened like that, really. Uh, <clears throat> So that's that's for one aspect, and then uh, this letting go uh, is, I mean, I would say the the moment after when you have in a way started the the struggle and on the, and you try to be hurt, and then I, and as I understand it, uh, again because uh, you you are, I mean, uh, the, if the goal is emancipation for everyone and not only your own. Uh, better life, but really emancipation, then we have to take in consideration what the common becomes into that. And we have to take in consideration the fact that maybe all uh, what I um, feel is not acceptable for others. And this is very difficult because we have this, uh, uh, yes, this kind of, uh, that that's, will sound harsh, but sometimes you know, this kind of drunkenness in the very fact that we feel vulnerable and just because we have this, this feeling of being so vulnerable, then we, this owed to us, and which is true up to a certain point, maybe, maybe, then there are others, uh, there are other claims that cannot be met exactly if everything is given to me, you understand? I mean, it's very much, it's much more complicated and my, 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 my claim must meet at some point, I accept to meet some kind of resistance, again, partial resistance, but this is what I meant by let go, because, again, per se, the experience of vulnerability is not a reason, per se. Thank you. Martin. Estelle, I have a question on the level of the conceptual strategy. Because if we would look at the tradition of critical theory, so Western Marxism in a broader sense, we might say that the two notions of alienation and exploitation also have that double side, that they refer to a feeling, a consciousness, an experience, and to objective factors that make you vulnerable to alienation and exploitation. So one might say the tradition could, in a way, overcome, let's say, the orthodox Marxist problem of focusing on class alienation and class exploitation by developing an intersectional understanding of alienation and exploitation. And I could think that this would come pretty close to what you think a broad and uh, comprehensive conception of vulnerability could be. So do you see a conceptual advantage to move the semantics on this field that you are proposing? And is there something that in a way unblocks some of the maybe constraints, restraints of let's say contemporary crit critical mm. theory that in a way may, remains bound to a, a set of traditional notions? And uh, maybe, yeah, yes. does not see the, the multi-dimensionality and the multi-level aspects of vulnerability. First, I would say that uh, I, I just take note 
of the grammar which is used today by many movements. And as I said, it's, it's very often vulnerability. And not only by movements, if you see, um, vulnerability is everywhere. You can, you can see companies talking about their vulnerability to risk. I mean, it's really all, all everywhere, but let's put this aside. So first, I just pay attention to the fact that we have these words and this grammar now, and that maybe just a sign of, a, let's say, post-Marxist struggle, post struggles could be, but it's clear that uh, yeah, in, in both in, 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 in Europe and in, in the United States at some point, I mean, let's say, yeah, I would say uh, around 2003, five, this idea of vulnerability was all, uh, everywhere. Maybe more, I mean, maybe that around Butler and everything in, in in, in the United States, it was about vulnerability to sheer violence, to terrorism, war, and things like that. While in France, um, maybe in, more generally in, in Europe, it was maybe first used in order to talk about those dispensable lives uh, all around the Castel, uh, this idea of uh, maybe something that was in the labor uh, framework. But the fact is that you have this uh, rising of, of this idea of vulnerability that, again, uh, maybe 40 years ago was only a, a word that could have been used by Christians. So, that, that, so first I just take note of that. Uh, maybe because uh, according to the famous definition of critical theory, you have to pay attention to the way uh, a certain uh, period or certain epoch uh, uh, struggles. Uh, so that's one reply. The second one, I completely understand what you mean what you, when you talked about, um, I mean, the fact that uh, alienation has both an objective and a subjective side. Now, I, I, I'm not sure about exploitation that I would really use in a very structural way. For me, it's, uh, it really has to do with, uh, I mean, the, the, means of, the distribution of the means of production and who's, where is the property and not, so it's very, I would have a very Marxist use of the idea, and in a way, the subjective experience is not central, as I understand it, to, uh, to the idea of exploitation. Even though, for sure, that triggers some kind of um, dis uh, distresses, that's for sure. But maybe it's not at the core of the very idea of exploitation, such as it, it was elaborated by Marx, as I understand it. Thank you, Estelle. I think this is, again, perfect time management. There seems to be no other urgent questions, so we can close this very session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Estelle, for this inspiring talk. <laughs> and thank you, Raina, also. And we now have half an hour um, as a break. <laughs>